I think that is the tragedy that this was imposed upon him and it in a sense shaped and misshaped and deformed his life. He could never free himself from that objective. While the content of the plot twists and turns from episode to episode, the broad premise of Succession has always been clear as day and summed up with something as simple as its title. Reinforced in the first episode as we immediately see that the King of the Castle is clearly unwell. Logan's health struggles plant a seed and provide an organic foundation from then on to allow each of the kids to state their cases, and it's a clever way to gradually introduce us to the internal political dynamics, as well as giving us an introduction to the characters, their claims, their positives and negatives, their psychological states. But in what would seem like an act of providence, Logan gets better, and continues fathering his children the way he had been doing previously, but with a bit more urgency given the state of things. Using this company as a testing ground as well as an indirect way to show his twisted love, molding them through brutality. The question that the plot teases seems to be this. Which of the siblings is best suited to getting the throne? And ultimately, which will get it? But a sentiment that I've seen gather pace throughout the fandom lately is that the question of the series has never been about which of the three will get it. It's been about whether or not Kendall will get it. You're my boy. My number one boy. While Roman and Shiv are absolutely central characters to the narrative, I've always felt that if you had to give one name for the story's primary protagonist, it would be Kendall. He is the one who is in most direct opposition to Logan right from the off, and I'd wager that he has just a tad more screen time than the others. He's the first character we see other than Logan, and the last one we see in the finale, being a bookend of sorts that the story starts and ends with. And while Roman and Shiv get tons of focus and attention from their father as they flirt with the idea of being his prodigal child and the heir apparent, they are never referred to as the number one. They never get an embrace quite like this. They were never gaslit to quite the extent that Kendall was, and if we know anything about Logan Roy, it's that abuse, neglect, manipulation, that is his love language. Now that's not to say that Logan loved Kendall more than the others, but the narrative fixation on who was going to be the successor always seemed to be fixated on Kendall just a bit more centrally than the other two. His arc always felt a bit more defined, a bit more of a focus. He spends the entire first season plotting multiple coups against Logan, all of which end in failure for different reasons. He spends the next season completely subservient to him before ultimately rebelling, after which he shows a lot of bluster, bravado, and empty ambition but never quite seems to have the stomach for the fight. And when he does finally muster it up in the wake of his father's death, he has the carpet swept up from under him. The rises and falls, the progressions and regressions, the little elements throughout. This is a true ensemble cast, but gun to my head and there's only ever been one primary protagonist. And the tone in Logan's voice as he explains to Kendall that he isn't cut out for this tells a tale of its own. There is resignation, perhaps an ounce of sympathy in his voice. But most of all, there is personal disappointment at what he views as an incontrovertible truth, having previously hoped for more. You're not a killer. You have to be a killer. And that is why it's so gratifying to Logan when he seems to be proven wrong with conviction. He never shows half as much pride throughout the entire story, and perhaps throughout his entire life, than he does in this moment. Roman and Shiv were perhaps thought of as better candidates at different times in Logan's life, but no one made him dream more of their potential in their most dizzying heights than Kendall. Now I don't know if Logan had a favorite, but if he did, due to all of this it's clear to me that it was undoubtedly Kendall. And as is the case throughout the final season, it's just a tiny bit of dialogue dropped in the midst of a storm that gives us another perspective on this entire character dynamic, and helps us understand why the self-proclaimed eldest boy is broken beyond repair. He, he, he fucking promised it to me. Promised. When I was seven. He sat me down at the candy kitchen in Bridgehampton, and he fucking promised it to me. Seven years old. Can you imagine? That was messed up. Like, he shouldn't have done that. 
Now, one could argue that Logan saying this isn't inherently the worst thing in the world had he actually followed through. It's a hell of a burden to put on a seven-year-old's shoulders, but if the person saying it is honest and fully intends to give their entire legacy to their child, who knows, maybe that could work. I wouldn't do it, but I'm sure there are situations like that all over the world that have worked out. However, Logan Roy is the worst sort of person to do this for his child. Because it instilled something in Kendall in his most formative years that made him dependent on something that would never be a certainty to be a certainty. From early childhood, he fervently believed that he was to be the one to succeed his father, and it was ingrained in him so early that it was his only purpose in life. It was established long before he had the chance to instill genuine purposes, and its establishment cut off the possibility of other purposes. Because, why would he need alternatives when his path was set for him? While Shiv and Roman were raised in this brutal meritocracy, they were not explicitly told at a young age what their future was. They did not instill it and conflate that purpose with their identity only to have said identity consistently played around with. And while Kendall had these growing ideas in his mind fueling a one-dimensionality in life, his siblings, despite their many psychological hang-ups, were growing other dimensions, things to fall back on. Imagine being told by the most important person in your life at age 7 what your future will be. Imagine fully believing it, conflating it with your sense of self, and fully banking your life on being centered on that one thing. Now imagine that the very same person who told that to you took that purpose away, and then put it back as a possibility, and then teased giving it to your siblings. With your identity fixated on that one thing, you would have no means whatsoever of substantiating yourself as a person with no way of knowing if your life is meaningful from one moment to the next. One day you could be fulfilling your role, the next you could be a failure. It is a deeply cruel thing that was done here, and it ensured that Kendall was filled with this underlying anxiety consistently, this need to prove himself and get the throne. Because if he didn't, then what purpose did he serve? In this way, Logan fundamentally broke Kendall as a person from the very beginning. I feel like if I don't get to do this, I, I, I feel like that's it. Like I might, I might, like I, I might die. Kendall felt as though it simply had to be him. At times, the show made it feel that way, and it certainly bewitched me throughout its run. But in the end, that was never a guarantee, especially with Logan himself being so wishy-washy. And so while Kendall would find a wife and a family, and try to find other dimensions in his life, none of that would cut it if he wasn't the king. Especially with his own children reminding him of his impotency and consequent inadequacy in his father's eyes. He craved connection and affection, but it never made him feel whole with his duty unfulfilled and he was never capable of experiencing genuine connection with his duty at the forefront of his life. Who knows how he would have turned out had he gotten the throne, but what is clear is that he was never going to be even a little bit fulfilled in life without it due to his broken psychology. This isn't to take away from the agency of his actions, of course. Kendall was a horrible person to so many around him, and I don't wish to say that this was out of his control, simply that there were fundamental reasons that he was the way he was. And so that is why, when all was said and done, and all three siblings were left without the throne, there were hints of alternate dimensions to fall back on, for two of them. Roman is hinted to be able to return to being this billionaire playboy as he abandons a life that he was never suited for. Shiv is broken herself, but there is a hint of hope for a life with some semblance of meaning with Tom, as bleak as that may seem. But Kendall has absolutely nothing. He was never equipped to be successful and fulfilled in his life, because that fulfillment was dependent entirely on a far-off dream that many would consider to be an impossibility due to who he was and who his father was. And yet, as long as there was hope, he'd keep striving for it with this fire. But with it completely snatched away, he quite literally has nothing to live for. He gave it all up for this dream, leaving a blazing path behind him and torching all in his wake. And it was all for nothing. I myself just speculated whether or not Kendall may have decided to kill himself right at the end of the series, but the truth is that he was dead the moment Shiv cast her vote. All life within him flickered and died, and from here on he was a hollow, broken man with the only purpose he ever thought of his entire life ripped away from him. And from that point, whether his death was to be slow or quick was up to him.
Many thanks for watching. He's lost his father, he's lost his morality, he's lost, in a sense, his soul, he's lost his brother and sister, he's lost his children, he's lost love, and he's lost his ambition, which is a defining thing for him in his life.